How do we point our kids to true greatness? Before we start, I want to get something out first. I want to get first things first. As Christians and as parents, we have freedom in Christ. We have so much freedom in Him. We are all messy. We are all going to make a ton of mistakes. And we're going to continue to make mistakes every single day on this side of heaven. That's just it. We are all messy. Um, the Lord loves us so much that He sends His Holy Spirit to prompt us and to guide us and to help us um, and to prod us and poke us in the right direction. But sometimes in our messiness, we can take things that we hear and we can just let it feel like guilt. And it can kind of feel like that big vine of guilt that's just around your neck and it's choking you and you're like, oh, great, one more thing that I messed up on. Or, you know, I'm totally failing in this direction. It's easy to do that. In our own messiness, our own insecurities, I have those things too. And so today, what I'd like to do is just know that the Lord tells us that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so to hear and to receive some of the things the Holy Spirit might be prompting you to, but in freedom in Christ, say, Lord, help that to change me instead of hold it as that guilt around our neck. Because um, if so, that's really not from him, if it's coming from that guilt. He gave you your kids, and he gives you first chances, second chances, third chances, and hundred chances. And so today, we just want to release all that guilt and um, receive what the Holy Spirit's putting on our heart. So let's start off in prayer today. Dear Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity this morning. We are crazy about you. We are crazy about our kids. And here's a really awesome thing. You love our kids even more than we do. We ask, Lord, today that you will break down all the things that we come with, the things from our own childhood, the things from our parenting, the mistakes we've made, that you will just wash that over in your forgiving waters and you will let today be a new start for us. To take a deep breath and to focus on what you want for our kids. We ask that you make this time something special in our hearts where we can just grow closer to you as we help our kids grow closer to you in this walk that they have on earth. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so with grace, lots of grace, and no guilt, we're going to move ahead and we're going to start a fresh journey. And we're going to take a look at what is true greatness. And what, where do your kids need to go? Um, we need to wrestle with what we really want for our kids. What do we want for them? Do we want them to be healthy? Do we want them to be happy, fulfilled? Can we actually verbalize right now? Can you draw a little cloud on your piece of paper? And in your cloud, can you write, what is it that you want for your kids? What do you want for them? Where do you want to go? Where do you want them to go? What do you want them to do in this world? Will the right college make it happen? The right self-esteem? It sounds superficial, but the right clothes, the right friends? What is it that you really want for your kids? Because as parents, we kind of have to think of where are we aiming them on the target? Um, our job is to point our kids in the right direction. Um, we're like an archer with our quiver, and we're pulling back our arrows, and we take years and lots of time to smooth out our kids on the arrows and to make sure they've got the right feathers and the right aerodynamics and we're going to pull back and pull back and pull back and it's painful sometimes and where are we going to point them to where how are we going to release them where are we sending them where are we pointing our kids to because our job as parents is to point our kids in the right direction where do we want them to shoot what's our target and so we kind of have to get to the point that we say, what's our goal in raising our kids? And you know what? We might say it's just to get them out of the house at 18. I just want them to be able to move out. I want them to be independent. How can I do that? Because they seem so dependent on mom. How can we get them to that place? But if we're like most parents, we want them to hit the bullseye of success. We want them to be successful. We want the very best for our kids. We want a good education. We want them to have a good job someday. Maybe a pretty spouse would be nice. Somebody that's going to make some cute grandbabies for us. <laughs> uh, maybe deep down, a little bit of something that makes them stand out. Good fame, a little fortune. 
to make us feel good, like we did a good job, that we raised some exceptional children. And you know what? Success is a legitimate parenting goal. If we're defining success as our children doing something productive with the gifts and talents that God gave them to enable them to be happy, independent adults. That is a legitimate goal of parenting. And we want that for our kids. We want them to use what God's given them. And we want them to be happy, independent adults. But the problem is, and in today's world, I know you guys feel this with me too because I feel it heavy. Sometimes I just feel heavy on my shoulders. We don't stop there. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we just kind of cut through what, um, down to the core, um, and we get pretty worked up on it. We want more than that. We want them all to each have stellar grades, to be on winning teams, to have strong athletic stats, wealth, beauty, popularity, to stand out in a crowd, to be desired, to have fame. But if it merely successful kids, why is that not enough? Successful by the world standards. Because we do not really need God to help us with that. I want you to hear that. Your unchurched, non-Christian friends and neighbors and teammates, they're doing that too. I mean, they are running the race right next to you if that's where you're aiming at. They're aiming at success for their kids too. And what happens when those things don't work out or they don't go to plan and our kids are sent reeling? Our kids can be successful by those standards without ever truly becoming great. And there's a difference there. There's nothing wrong with any of those things above. I mean, I have high standards for my kids. I make them work hard. I want them to work hard. And I press them to value excellence in all that they do. And our kids might get some of those wonderful things that we look at by default on the way to a great life. Because that's just the Lord. And He loves to pour blessings on our kids. But if we're only aiming our kids at success, then we are aiming too low. We are aiming too low. God has bigger plans for our kids than that. And so we're going to take a defi- look at a definition of what true greatness is. Okay, True greatness is a passionate love for God that demonstrates itself in an unquenchable love and concern for others. If we're honest with ourselves, and this is me too, we want our children to be it and everything and be well paid, well supplied, well received, and have no huge major pitfalls in their life. That's what we call a successful life. That's kind of our standard for it. But here's the thing. According to Jesus, if we want our kids to be truly great, We must first teach them to be not A-plus students, not Johnny Hustle, not great athletes. We must first teach them to be servants. And we're going to take a look at, um, if we really think about it, um, if we go to Scripture, this Bible verse, Jesus called, can you guys see, if I pull back just a second? Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is very clear on what he sees as greatness. You know, this, um, if we're honest with ourselves, one of those mornings that we just got to be honest, most parents are not raising their kids to serve others, but to be served. Take a look at the difference between success and true greatness. Success looks inward. True greatness looks upward and outward. Success is about my agenda True greatness is about God's agenda. Success accommodates selfishness. True greatness celebrates altruism. It means caring about others. Success is about receiving. True greatness is about giving. Success worships what it sees in a mirror. True greatness grieves over what it sees through its windows. 
Success pays off for now. True greatness pays off forever. You know, this, this attitude, it, it's, it's not of the world, what we're talking about. It's not the place that our children live in. It's not reality for them. We're raising our kids to be served instead of to serve. To be the first, to own the best, to won't let anyone get in your way, to compete, compare, control. It's kind of this rush that we live in right now in this time in history. And you know, that philosophy that if we better get going or we're going to fall behind, it finds no home in the heart of God. He has much bigger and better plans for your children than merely indulging them with what they want. He cares more about their character than their comfort. And that's why he put us as parents in that equation. It's because we can help them. We can show them true greatness, what the ultimate goal in life is, by showing them him. And so, that is all philosophy. How does it become reality in our life? That's what we want to know. Okay, Mary, this is all stuff that's, you know, we can put them in clouds above us. How does this become reality in our family? Well, we keep some phrases in our head as um, we get real. We have to actually get real with each other. And, and, you know, this would be a great conversation to have with your spouse. Where are you aiming your kids? What draws your passion? What would our kids say we think is greatness? Maybe write a little sentence there on your piece of paper. If you were to ask your kids, Mom and Dad think true greatness is blank. What would your kids say that you feel true greatness is? I'm kind of scared at maybe sometimes what my kids would say. I would, they would put in that blank. Some of the things that maybe I've made a priority in our family that I've put a little too much emphasis on. Messages I've sent them over the years about what I really believe true greatness is. You know, so what do we have to do? We have to get real. Um, we has, it has to do with how, what things that we do as a family, what things we emphasize, what things we prioritize, what things we glorify in our home. Take a look at these questions. To figure out where you're aiming your kids, look at your calendar. How much time do you spend nurturing an other-oriented attitude in your children? Look at your checkbook. How much of your resources are going to serve others rather than yourself? Look at your attitude. What really makes you feel like deep down you're doing a good job raising your kids? What kind of activities do you do that bring out that attitude in your kids and bring it out in you? Look at your heart. What are things that bring true joy and satisfaction to you and your family? And look at your reputation. How would your friends, coworkers, teachers, neighbors characterize your priorities? From a distance, from close up, Right, this is where those vines of guilt can start climbing up our neck. Push them down, Lord. Because what we want to do is we want to say, Father, show in us the things that we struggle with. Put a circle around or a star next to maybe the thing in your family that is the biggest troublemaker. <laughs> the biggest thing that lowers our arrow down so that we're not focusing at the bullseye. Man, I can tell you which one mine is. That calendar is hard, isn't it? <laughs> It's hard. There's so many great things to do. There's so many good things to do. And we've got to get to a place where we start saying, there's so many good things to do in our life. What's the best thing for my kids? What's the best thing for my kids? You know, because what we need to do is we need to redefine what greatness is in our family. And we might need to confess. We might need to take this, or good Lutherans, um, some of us, so we got to take that list and look through and say, what if we, you know, what if we messed up on Lord? Help me. I'm going to say, Lord, look at those things and cleanse me. Clean out my heart and help me do it in a different way. And I, you can even say to your kids, I've been off in this area. I want God to get my vision and our vision for our family back on track. And we start, we start by letting our kids know that it's not, you know, remember her? <laughs> it's not all about 
me. <laughs> it's not all about me. We trust that God works for the good of those who love him. So when bad things happen, we trust Jesus. We keep teaching our kids. This is the practical thing that we do every day. We keep teaching our kids that life is not about us. How are we doing about that? Are we? Because, man, I know my kids sometimes think that life is all about them. God is just using us and our life here on earth to accomplish the goals. Some things that we may never see this side of heaven. And when that attitude shines through our kids, that it's not about them, it's so counterculture to what the world is saying that you have to be first and best and it's got to be you, 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 or me, 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 me. That when, when our kid, when people see that in our kids and they see it in us, it shines through and this world doesn't know how to react to it. This world does not know how to react to it. And in doing that, your kids have so much power in this world by being a servant. That's exactly what Jesus meant by, do you want to be great? I'm going to show you how to be great. You serve. Because that's the key, is that it's not about them. It's not about them. And the motivation plays a big part in it, too. And when you start, and you know, the really sweet thing is, it's not because of what we do. It's because of what Jesus is doing through us. And so they're not seeing our kids when our kids act that way or when we act that way, they're seeing Jesus shine through. We're just the vehicle for how the Lord shines through in us because he modeled it for us. What did he do? He washed people's feet. He hung out with people that needed help. He was a total model of how to serve other people. And when you live and you teach your kids to live for his purposes, everything, believe it or not, falls into place. All of the other things, those questions about popularity and what are they going to do with their life, it all floats into place because God already had a plan for our kids. We just get so bent up and tight that we don't think about what he's already got planning for our kids. And so there's a reason and a purpose behind what happens in your life when you live this way. A prayer I say with my kids all the time, I have to say it for myself, is, Father, show me what you're going to do with this. When something bad happens or something goes off of plan from what I want, show me what you're going to do with this, Father. And then I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. So I want to tell you about my son who broke his arm. He's in a cast right now. Um, he was pushed off a merry-go-round going at high speed. Had his feet kicked out from underneath him. And it was an accident. But it was a complete lack of judgment and control for a 13-year-old boy to do this to him. A little bit of yuck thrown in there. And uh, this kid that did it has had more struggles in his life than you can imagine. And uh, that's pretty rough. But as we drove to the ER, I was pretty close to freaking out. I mean, chicken wing and everything. But the Holy Spirit had that prayer on my lips. I trust you, Jesus. Show me. Just show me what you're going to do with this. Because I don't understand it. Out of the blue. And he did. He did. He gave a supernatural peace to my son in the ER. I mean, it's shown through to everybody. It's shown through to the doctors, to the nurses. I mean, anyone who walked near him, he didn't complain once, even though it was crazy amount of pain as they tried to pull his bones back in place. They just couldn't stop talking about how peaceful he was. And he kept, he was more concerned about me than he was about himself. He didn't complain that even though he was set to be the captain of the baseball team this spring, and that he was going to play with his brother on the baseball team for the first time in four years, and they had big plans. That all the things that he had planned for the next three months of his eighth grade year were kind of dissolved. He hasn't complained once. And the interesting thing is that when he got home, he got on the phone and he called that young boy, someone he's not really close friends with, and he said, I just want to let you know that it's okay and that I forgive you. He did this in front of his three younger brothers and sisters, in front of us, because they were angry and I was angry. And I saw something in him 
that I said, Lord, my mind is so little. My mind is so little. All I can think about is baseball and the glory that he was going to get on that field. I can't even see what you're doing in his life. That's bigger than any of the little plans that we have. And I just sat there and said, Lord, your ways are not my ways. Your ways are higher than my ways. And my husband and I were blown away with what changed in his character in that particular episode. I mean, how you can use this little boy. And here's the thing. I have no idea the ripples of that. I just know how it impacted me. That's all that the Lord was showing me at that moment. I have no idea the impact of the ripples that it showed on this other, on maybe this young man, who for the first time, I mean, it took days, days for him with the prodding of his mother to apologize. Days. Never quite in his, and you know, that's okay. So I told Jack, this is now, you took care of this right here. Let the Lord sort out all of this. And it changed our perspective as a family. And here's the thing. We have to trust God. And every day I look at that cast, I have to remember to forgive. I have to remember to change my focus. I have to remember that God's ways are not my ways. His ways are higher. His aim is higher for my kids than what my aim is. My aim is that little target down here. Oh, I want him to have a couple home runs this season. And yay, won't that be fun? Everyone can say, that's my son. You know, and besides the fact that I'm sharing that with you, nobody would know what happened in our family. All they would say is, man, that stinks that Jack got knocked out of baseball. That stinks. You know, it gave me a glimpse of what happened with, you know, what God wants to do in my son's life that's way bigger than what I can do. And you know, it shouldn't be that surprising to me. It shouldn't be that surprising. Because I walked this, and a couple of you who are my friends in here know this, but I walked this just um, 18 months ago with my mother. My mom was the most servant-hearted woman that you could meet. Um, she was that, not that. <laughs> she was the example that you would love to be. I mean, just, just really amazing. My mom was diagnosed with cancer um, two years ago, this February, and she died a year ago um, in December. And she was really sick for a while, and I was, went up to St. Louis to take care of her every other week in the last four months of her life. And um, she was fighting the cancer for a while, and the chemo was pretty hard on her body. And after one treatment that I was up there, it was a Friday afternoon, she had just finished her intensive chemo treatment, and all of a sudden we're sitting there, and she was trying to eat something, but she was going to get sick with it. And all of a sudden she goes, something's wrong. And her whole tooth on the side had just collapsed. It was from the chemo. And it's Friday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, I'm like, Mom, what's your dentist's name? She couldn't think of her dentist's name. You know, they had just had all these changes. They had just sold their house of 45 years. And she's like, oh, Mary, I don't know where the phone book is. And I said, okay. I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do? Of course a dentist is closed at 2 o'clock on a Friday <laughs> afternoon. And I went into the... I went into the closet in her house. I closed the door. I don't know what to do. Why are you doing this to her? Why are you doing this to her? When all she's ever done is love you and serve you, why are you doing this? Lord, I don't know what to do. And I dropped to my knees. And for some reason, he just put in there, just say, I trust you. Just say, I trust you, Mary. Just say, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. And I didn't know what to do. I got up took a deep breath, went out and said, okay, mom, let's get in the car. Kind of wheeled her down to the car. And I said, let's just figure out if we can figure out where your dentist is. So show me where it is. So we're driving across town. They had just moved to a senior center. And we end up in the driveway of we find her dentist. You know, now 2.30 on a Friday afternoon. We pull in. There's one car there. We walk in. And I said, hi. I said, this is my mom. She's a patient of the dentist. And I said, do you think you could help her? Her tooth collapsed. And the dentist the, the dentist wasn't there, but his assistant was there. She goes, I'm sorry, we're closed. She'll have to make an appointment on Monday. And I said, okay. And everything in my being wanted to stamp and scream and yell, do something. And I said, okay. And my mom said, you know, I just never knew that the chemo would do this kind of thing, you know, in her sweet little way. And the lady goes, why are you taking chemo? And she goes, well, I've got cancer. I've got lung cancer. And, you know, and it's just been a hard road this last month, but we're getting through it. And the lady goes, my mother has lung cancer. She 
grabbed my mom's hand and she took her to the back. She patched up her tooth as best as she could, which was the way that it was patched up till she passed away. But here's the neat thing. As we're leaving, she grabbed, my mom grabbed her hand and she said, tell me about your mom. I want to know her name so I can pray for her. And the lady goes, my mom, she told her about her. My mom goes, can I share with you the hope I have in Jesus? Can I share it with you? I thought I was going to be sick. And I went outside and I sat down on the, on the ground and I just bawled. And I said, Lord, your ways are not my ways. You're going to use my 80-year-old mother, make her tooth dissolve, haul her across town to a dentist at 2 o'clock in the afternoon so she can share in her crippled state the hope that she has in Jesus in you for her and for her mother who's probably going to die. Get out. It's not about me. My life is like on coasters, Lord. You just move me where you want to use me. And it doesn't matter if I'm a 13-year-old boy who breaks my arm or an 80-year-old mother who's dying of cancer or a 30-something, 40-something mom who's trying her best, dad, who's trying her best to raise her kids to God's glory and is frustrated that things aren't falling into place the way that they should be. It's because it's not about us. You know, what I learned with that, and with my sweet mom, and what I learned with Jack, is that God cares more about our character than he does about our comfort. Man, my mom wasn't comfortable, and Jack sure, certainly wasn't comfortable. And those are physical pain kind of things. But I'm sure that you guys right now could um, put some ways that your kids are hurting in their life. Maybe it's not physical. Maybe it's social. Maybe it's with friends. Maybe it's relationally. Maybe it's academically. But here's the thing we've got to bank on is that these are his children. He, he promises that he has great plans for them. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He doesn't say, you know, plans to maybe make, help you make it with something in life. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We're just borrowing our kids for a while. He never promises us that everything will be perfect. People break arms. People get cancer. Plans change. But the promise is that he says is that he will never, ever leave us. And you know, we feel his presence in good times and in bad times. He uses bad times. He uses bad situations. He even uses people to let us know that he is always with us. And that's what we need to be sharing with our kids. We're studying um, insects right now. And I was reading a story about a butterfly. And it was coming out of the cocoon. And I was reading it to my kids. And this little girl takes her, decides she, she's watching the butterfly struggle to get out of the cocoon. And the little girl takes her little fisker scissors. And she's like, I'm going to help the butterfly. She comes over and she cuts the cocoon for the butterfly thinking it's going to fly, it's going to be made it so easy, now it's ready to go. And that little butterfly sat there all withered on the bottom of the ground, and it died. And here's the thing, the struggle of a butterfly coming out of the cocoon, the blood of the pushing through the cocoon pushes the blood into the outside of its wings, and that's what allows a butterfly to be able to fly. So when that little girl thought that she was cutting those scissors to help it, she actually crippled it and killed it for life. You know, that struggle in our kids is what the Lord is going to use to help them be who he wants them to be. And sometimes we try to soften that too much as moms. Man, I do. We don't want that for our kids. But if we look back and we talk about the times that the Lord was... We felt his presence most in our life. It was usually through negative, tough things that he was holding us right in his hand. We can look back at wedding memories and fun trips, and those are awesome. Those are gifts from the Lord too. But it's the struggle sometimes, and God knows that. I'm a really sweet student. I teach English to junior high and high school kids, and I have a high school student that I've had as an English teacher for several years. She's a beautiful girl, works her tail off. It doesn't come easy for her. 
Everything that takes somebody an hour, it takes her five hours. And she gets so frustrated. And her mom gets so frustrated. Every day is hard for her to get her papers cranked out and to learn. But I think that she is truly great. And here's why. You know, she is using that struggle. It, it, her attitude is amazing. Her walk is amazing with the Lord. Her talk, how she talks about it. She's like, man, this is tough. But perseverance, Mrs. Stockton, perseverance. And I'm like, you're going to make it. God is going to use, I tell her all the time, God is going to use this struggle in your life to make you the woman that he wants you to be someday. He is preparing you, not for just bigger struggles. You don't want to, like, throw Debbie Downer, you know, or something bad that's coming down the line. God's preparing you for it. You know, not doing that. He's preparing her for something great. He's preparing her for something great. That episode with my mom changed my life. And that's the only thing that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit put those words on my lips of I trust you, Jesus, with my son. I'd forgotten but he's so sweet to remind us. I had to remember to put those lips, I trust you, Jesus, I trust you, Jesus. Bad times, I trust you. You know, when we actively look at a situation and we ask God, what do you want to teach my child in this? How will he use this to shape them? So we let them be uncomfortable when they need to be. We stop trying to be their best friend and soften every blow. We let them feel what they need to, and we love them through it because God doesn't take us out of the tough times. Instead, we focus on who is the master of those tough times, who's holding them all together. You know, we let our kids, we need to let our kids fail sometimes. And we, let them, we need to let them know our failures. Um, we don't always need to bail them out. And the way that they learn the consequences, they can learn true greatness from that. Humility, forgiveness from others, yes, but from the Lord. We watch our reactions to their disappointments and their tragedies. We remain calm, or at least try to. But we let them feel it to learn how to accept responsibility for their actions. This actually leads them on the right path. We become a family that models forgiveness. We ask for their forgiveness when we need to. So we don't buffer our kids from everything. We let them feel it sometime, but we're right there with them to point them back where they need to go. It's a big one for me. We look at our kids as teachers, not as trophies. We check our reaction to their disappointments and their trials and to the ways that God is shaping our kids. We put things in perspective and we ask God to help us get past our own garbage. We all got it. Our kids are going to have their own garbage someday too. You know, That's living on this side of heaven. We're all going to have it coloring us and how we treat our kids and what expectations we throw on them. So our child does not make first strain or get the highest grade. When we get upset, where is it coming from? Can God use that situation again in our lives to shape the character in our kids? When we take something so personally that happens to them, it's an issue with us. We're looking at our kids to be our trophies. And God wants us to let them be our teachers. He can use a lot of things to shape you in this world. He can use cancer. He can use unemployment. He can use a lot of things. Let him use your kids. They're with you right now. Learn from them in the good times and the bad times. I mean, activities are great. We do a lot of activities as a family. We do sports. We do drama. We do music. We do fun stuff as a family. But let those activities shape your kids to greatness and his glory. Only let those activities be vehicles for how they're going to shape their, your kids. When you see an activity that's not bringing out those qualities in your kids, make changes. How can we make changes to get our kids where they need to be? And finally, there's a secret. Where, oh, one more thing. We cultivate Thanksgiving. Contagious Thanksgiving in our family. Contagious Thanksgiving. We started this year on January 1st. We got this metal box. It's really cute. And it's got these little holes in it. And I put some sticky notes next to it. And I told my kids, whenever anything happens, good or bad, I want you to write, thank I want you to write a Thanksgiving on there to the Lord. And it's just filling up and filling up and filling up. It's really sweet. When my dad was here, he wrote one and stuck it in. And when one of them had a bad day or took a bad test, we wrote it in there and we stuck it in. Thank you, Lord, for getting us through this day. 
sometimes it was like, thank you, Lord, for the end of the day, you know? <laughs> but I want them to cultivate thankfulness, 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 because everything in this world is entitlement, entitlement, entitlement. This is what I deserve. This is what I should get. No more is that coming into my family. I'm going to put the brakes on that the minute I see it. You know, I have a friend, they, they walk it. They walk this in their family. And we were at the pool, and my kids had gotten Chick-fil-A, which was a huge treat. Because Chick-fil-A is expensive. <laughs> and they're all eating Chick-fil-A, and my friend, who has five kids, came running up the path. And my kids were like, we got Chick-fil-A. And one by one, each of her kids walked in and said, good for you. And the next one, good for you. And they weren't saying it like, good for you. They were sincerely happy for them. <laughs> they had their little peanut butter and jelly in their bag. Their mom and dad had taught them to be thankful from the, that, that they just cultivate it in their family. No matter if it's bad, good. This is an easy one to get started on with your family. Bad times, good times. Let's think of something that we can really praise God in this situation. It'll really start to change your heart. There's a neat book. It's called A Thousand Gifts. If you're looking, it's a kind of a poetic kind of a book. It has like a poetry feel to it. Written by a woman whose um, sister was hit by a car when she was just a little kid and died right in front of her. And she starts this journey of how she is going to make a list of a thousand things to be thankful for. And that's what gave me the idea for the box. And um, she starts looking for not big things like my family, my job. You know, she wasn't going, to, she was doing small things. Like, I love the way the sun hits the bubbles when I'm washing the dishes. You know, I had a mom tell me once, you know what, when you're mopping the floor, look over at your child and give them a smile and a wink. Let them see that you're thankful in all circumstances. Instead of, I can't believe how messy you kids are, I hate this. <laughs> you know, which is what we all are thinking, you know. You know. I just mopped this yesterday. Um, but to let them see that Thanksgiving flows from a different place. And it comes from the Holy Spirit working in our lives, working in our kids. Like We can cultivate that. We can grow a garden of Thanksgiving with our kids. That's something that can start today. Okay. We break out the secret weapon. So what's the secret weapon? There's a secret weapon that pulls all this together. Salem School is doing a great job in this. We pull out a secret weapon. It's service. We teach our kids to serve. We find things to do that they can serve. You know, hate flat soda. Don't you say hate flat soda? You go, especially those two liters that the kid opens, and then you go to pour some. It's like nobody put the lid back on. It's worthless. You just pour it down the drain. Once soda loses its fizz. A Christian who does not share their faith is like flat soda. That's what I was taught when I was little. Just kind of there. No bubbles, no sparkle. And there's a lot of ways to share your faith. And one way is through serving. That's the way that touches more people's hearts than going up and shaking someone and saying, love Jesus! <laughs> you serve. You teach your kids to serve. I love what Salem's doing with Kenya. Totally changing the hearts of the kids and the malaria nets. Oh my goodness. What are we teaching our kids with that? What a gift. Because, you know, if most parents aren't raising their kids to serve others, but to be served. And that's okay that our kids like to be served sometimes. But we've got to roll the other way too. We've got to make sure that we teach them there's a joy in service. It gives sparkle and excitement to your family in so many ways. And you know what? It is giving your kids the chance to be the hands and feet in Jesus. And every time you serve as a family or you allow your child to serve, that arrow is just shooting up at a higher target. Because you're moving them from things of the world that the Lord will probably give your kids anyway. Because he just is crazy about them. To moving it up to things that are of his heart and of service. You know, um, we're following the arrow pattern of Jesus when we serve. And so we reinforce that it's not about us. We intentionally look for ways to take the focus off of us. Because honestly, between Facebook and cell phones and our schedules and reality TV shows and magazines and life, everything makes our kids kind of get focused on how do you serve me? What can I get next? When you can be intentional, intentional is the word here, about finding ways for them to serve, you're going to start some, for some really sweet things to happen there. You know, 
Um, how do you do that? You start at home. You help them learn to serve their brothers and sisters. You help them learn to serve your brothers and sisters. I tell my boys all the time how you treat your sisters, the pray, training ground, how you serve your sisters, training ground for how you're going to serve your wife someday. I tell my girls how you serve your brothers is training ground for how you're going to serve your husband someday. So we all serve each other to lift each other up. And that's important that we make that happen in our home. Make chores in your house something where you tell your kids, we're in this together. We can do this. We're serving each other. We're taking care of the home that God gave us. Aren't you thankful for our home? Let's take care of it. Let's do it as a family. We look for ways in our neighbor, our church, our community, our school. And we pray that God will use those ways to shape his character through service. We make time for it in our schedule. My father-in-law, his dad, he would have Chris mow the neighbor's yard, who was this elderly couple, every week. Never got paid for it. Just didn't even, didn't even give them a choice. Just said, do it, do it. So your kids are outside and they're picking up the pine cones in your yard. Say, you know what? Bless your neighbor. Go pick up the pine cones in their yard too. And do it with a joyful heart. Three things that I say to my kids all the time when they do something. You do it immediately. You do it completely. And you do it joyfully. I have it written in my kitchen. And I call them on it. <laughs> Whenever they don't do it one, I want them to do it joyfully. I want them to serve joyfully. Whether they're doing something for me or they're doing something for somebody else. We go to the nursing home every Thursday. We've been doing this for seven years. My kids each have an adopted grandparent there. It is not easy to find the time to go there. There's too, a lot of stuff going on. Um, my son Peter, his grandma, died last spring after four years together. Her name was Miss Helen. She was 101 years old. Peter was asked to speak at our funeral, 11 years old. He had just turned 11. And um, I told him, I said, do you realize what an opportunity this is? To, what an opportunity to share your love for her. You share your love with her family. What sweet ways that the Lord can bless you through this and that you can be blessed. And if you ask my kids, people will say, oh, I bet you guys do so much joy there. And I've told my kids over and over again, uh-uh what we're receiving in the process. He was way more blessed by his relationship with Miss Helen than I believe that she was ever blessed by him. Huge way that God has used that to shape. You know, um, we have to be intentional. We just, um, we were asked by somebody here at Salem, my family, to help box up boxes of um, food at team ministry before Christmas. And so we were, as a family, went and we um, boxed up food. And when we were there, we had noticed that the place needed to be painted, and we just started talking. Well, my son has this kind of group of friends that he does like a Friday night youth kind of thing with once a month. And so I said, you know what? Let's just see if your little group of friends might want to come and do this. And so before you know it, we had 20 teenagers and a couple of dads who were really brave who came, and we decided to reshelf the food at team. And I know Salem does so many neat things like this, too, where they were helping to stock perk and whatever. And I prayed hard the night before. I said, Lord, you make, you make available every one of those kids to work their tail off. Please, Lord, every single one of them. Don't let them just be standing there like, I don't have anything to do. You know, I hate that when you go on a service project, you don't have anything to do. Please, Lord, make them work hard. I'll tell you, those kids, we, we had so much work, we didn't know what to do. And we were there, we were supposed to be there for like three hours, we were there for like six. I mean, it took forever to get all the work done. And that night, I saw a couple of those teenage kids. I said, you worked really hard today. And they were like a can of soda that you had just opened. They were bubbling and fizzing all over. Mrs. Stott, and it was awesome. I mean, we were working together, and there was a synergy, and we got so much. Did you see how great those food shelves looked when we got done? We probably organized 8,000 cans when we were there. And the Boy Scouts had just collected food. There was food all over the place. I was like, wow, we picked a good week. <laughs> you have no idea how generous our families are who give to the Boy Scouts. It was crazy. It was really cool. And I saw something in them, this bubble, that changed um, it. You know, um, I love this uh, quote from C.S. Lewis. You aim at heaven, and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you'll get neither. You know, I've kind of been following, I'm not a big country music fan, but um, I've been following what happened to Mindy McCready. You guys have seen that in the paper? And I think, man, 
I'm sure that her family, that girl had success. That girl had success. And there's no greatness in that story. That God can still work ripples in amazing ways. And I'm sure he's not done with that family. I don't want that for my kids. I want them to be great in the Lord's eyes. Because they're being like him. Not because they need to earn their salvation, but because they love him so much. It's just oozing out of their being. You know what? When I'm obedient to him, and I put first things first with him, I leave the results up to him. I'm going to say, Lord, we're going to do right here. We're going to point our kids in the right direction, and I'm going to leave the results up to you. And you know what? In so many times, he throws in earthly success because he can. He can. And so that's really important. I love that Bible verse. That is our, that is our home family Bible verse. I don't know if you guys have a family Bible verse. Um, we have that up in our wall where my kids do their homework in their school. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord and not for men. It's really easy sometimes when they're doing something and I'll say, I'll oh, get it done, Mom, because you want me to. Uh-uh. I don't want them to have that force inside them. I want it to be, we do, we're excellent in what we do because we're doing it for the Lord. And so what that does is it gives them a different motivation to work hard at their school and at their sports and at their music. Are they going to be excellent at all those things? Uh, I don't know. Probably not. I could tell you some big holes. But they love the Lord and they're working hard from a different motivation there. And that's important. And finally, how do we sort through aiming our kids at greatness? Because it's really easy when you've got music and sports and all this stuff going on. I find that it's helpful to go back to three questions when you're making choices with your kids. Three questions that we're aiming our kids through to true greatness in three, it comes down to three questions. The first one is, how do I want to serve in my life? What do I want to do? What is your child equipped to do? What, what did God make them to do? How are they going to serve? You guys all have to answer that question. I'm going to be a communications representative. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a nurse. How are you going to serve in your life? Focus it to your kids. How are you going to serve in your life? How are you going to serve the Lord in anything you do? Because you can serve in a million ways. You don't just have to be a pastor or a teacher. Those are great things. There's a million ways that you can serve God. Let your kids know that. They've got to answer that question. You can help them narrow it down. Who will my master be? Who do I want to serve? Because you know what? Everybody's got a master. Do you get that? Everyone has a master. There's someone that we're all bowing to. I pray it's Jesus for my kids. I pray they see that in me, that that's who my master is. Because I'm going to work towards something. Who am I going to work for? It doesn't matter if I work at a hospital or if I work at a convenience store. Who am I working for? Remember doing all things, using whatever you do, do it as if you're doing it for the Lord and not for men. It'll change how your kids work. And the last one, who do I want to serve with? Who do I want to marry? Those three questions, they should be shaping some of the choices that you make as family. And as and and. And when it's easy to get caught and there's so much going on and I'm so caught in everything, going back to those three questions and saying, Lord, how can I help my children in this area? Because really what I want is I want them to find something where they're going to be able to serve you. I want them to always know that they're serving you. And I will prepare them for the person that they're going to serve with someday. I want to prepare them for that. And so the training ground for all of these is service, believe it or not. What kind of employee or boss do I want my child to be someday? Who, do I, who will I work for? Money, fame, God? Who do I spend, want them to spend my life with? How can I teach them what kind of characteristics I want them to look for in a wife or husband someday? Those are the things I should be putting my energy in and praying about. You know, because this is training ground for life with our kids when we focus on service with our kids. So there's lots of stuff, and there's a whole lot more. If you take a look at that sheet, um, 
that's in front of you. Um, we're not going to go through it, but I want you to take a look at it. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to put a little star next to some things that maybe, these are very practical ways, um, maybe some things that you struggle with, or maybe you put the initial of your child next to it, of some things that your child struggles with. Um, maybe go through it with your husband, your wife. Um, go through and take a look at what true greatness um, the, or on the page it says living grace out loud for your kids. Grace that demonstrates itself in attitudes of humility, gratefulness, generosity, and a servant attitude. Circling those three things that are underlined. What does humility look like in your kids? What does gratefulness look like? What does generosity look like? And what does a servant attitude look like? Some of my favorite um, ones on there um, are, uh, there's just so many of them that are so sweet. I like the one at the bottom, one, uh, number three, underneath, what does a servant attitude look like? They realize that serving others isn't always a pers personally appreciated or publicly recognized, um, and they don't take it personally. When we were cleaning the food pantry, <laughs> this little boy named Josiah was with a, a mom, and they were down on the floor, and they were scrubbing the bottom of the food shelves. And um, my friend Kristen looked at this little boy and said, um, you know, I don't think anybody's ever done this in 30 years. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's pretty nasty. And she goes, and you know what? I'm not sure anybody but Jesus will ever know that we did it. And the little boy looked at her and goes, that's enough. And I thought that was pretty cool. I thought, oh my goodness, let that be enough. Let it be that your kids have integrity to do the right thing even when nobody else is around. Um, there might be some things that we have to circle in here. Um, you know, I want to look at number four underneath. What does gratefulness look like in our kid's life? They view each day with a joyful attitude regardless of the setbacks that come their way. Um, my dad's a really neat person. And, you know, he he's, um, was a teacher for 45 years. And uh, the day my mom was buried, we were all staying in the same house. It was December 3rd last year. He woke up that morning and he started to walk down the steps. And all his grandkids are all dressed in their funeral finest. As he walks down the steps, he goes, Well, kids, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, you know, we're all like, <laughs> And what do you do? But say, get on with it, Lord. That's what she want us to do. That's what you want us to do. And it I said, how can we be? That doesn't mean we didn't cry. And that didn't mean that that wasn't a day. But it changed our focus that day. It was like, okay, Lord, how does this change who we are? How does this change whose we are? And uh, that stood out to me. What an example that was to my kids. And on the last one, it says, ways for parents to build and model a great attitude in your kids' heart. This one is for mom and dad. It's hard. It's hard. Um, I have, uh, the one that I have at home is all beat up because I have all these things like, ugh, yuck, you know, things that I work, that I struggle with. Some of them are making small choices um, about making sure with your church Things that you um, never criticize your church or your school or your teachers in front of your kids. Let them see thankfulness drip out all over the place. Let it be that you're so thankful for what God is doing in your life here at Salem Church and at school or whatever church you go to, that your kids see that as well. And so some of these are hard, hard, hard. Go through and highlight, maybe take a couple sticky notes with you and write the ones that really stand out to you on there. Stick it in the middle of your steering wheel and say, I will not, or Lord, help me with this on something that maybe is difficult for you. Um, because we're still growing. We're all still growing, and we're going to be messy this side of heaven. But in our messiness, the Lord can lead our kids and our families to greatness, His greatness, for His glory and for no one else's. And so I'm praying um, for great things for your family. It was an honor to be able to come and share with you.